So, uh, 4.55 p.m. Um, I'm quite happy to see so many people here. I would not expect that anywhere else. I guess that's a great thing about uh, CNCF uh, conferences. Everyone is so excited and keen. Um, all right, so I know I am the only thing that is stopping you from going outside and having drinks. So I'll try to make it really quick, you know, try to make it interesting. I just have 137 slides, so that should be fine. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, I should not say a lot about PowerPoint slides because my wife is a management consultant and that's basically all her work. So I should not talk bad about PowerPoint. Uh, but yeah, uh, let's start. So Kubernetes as a platform framework. Uh, we've spent a lot of time, I would say, uh, in terms of automation, right? Uh, initially, we had tools like Chef and Puppet. 2004 seems like a lifetime away. And then we had Ansible, we had Terraform, and it's been almost like two decades of automation. And I, I just wonder if we've reached a point where we're quite happy about our automation platform engineering uh, and also internal developer platforms as well. Uh, let's dive deeper into this and see if we are happy about it. So in a general uh, speaking terms, if we talk about platform engineering, we are talking about a team that basically goes ahead and builds your infrastructure and makes life easy for developers. And initially, it's just a small, well-knit team that regularly talks and interacts with developers. But then as soon as things get complex, things are bigger in terms of scale and size, we start dividing these teams into various different teams, like the network team, creating your network infrastructure, VPCs and so. And then we have the infrastructure team, providing you the ability to go ahead and uh, use um, clusters, EKS being one of them. And then we'll have observability team. Obviously, we need monitoring. Uh, and then we also go ahead and spend a lot of money on monitoring. Uh, that's a different topic. I, I always get really exci excited, not excited, but passionate about it in terms of how much you spend on monitoring. And at the end, we use tools like KubeCost, which is also monitoring about cost and so on. But then we also have team that is really important, uh, security and compliance. And after all of this, this basic setup of these four realms uh, for us to deploy uh, our workloads into a Kubernetes uh, cluster, we have the developers who will go ahead and deploy these apps. But we also have another layer, which is the uh, AWS resources. So your app is dependent on these AWS resources. And I'm not sure, maybe uh, if I can see a um, raise of hands uh, to know if anyone over here can claim that they can do all of this and deploy to a new region uh, within a day or two. Yeah, I have one out there and I want to talk to you afterwards. I want to learn more. Uh, but so there are a fairly few n names out there that can claim that they can deploy uh, within a day or two or a week even. Going throughout the process and then using their platform to go ahead and enable developers to do the same. So my role over here as uh, an AWS solutions architect, uh, my name is Navya, and what I do is I help customers build their platforms in terms of infrastructure, in terms of Kubernetes platforms as well. And when I say build, what happens is we're talking about not weeks, but months, where we see this process take place for a new region, new account, new application, and think to ourselves that two decades of automation and we are still taking months to deploy uh, these workloads. And this is where I come in. I'm not talking about building platforms like I go ahead and help them being hands-on. What we do is, we go ahead and take a step back and see how can the platform be more efficient by finding bottlenecks. And the bottlenecks lies in those months that we're talking about. Why is it taking 
so many months for us to deploy these workloads with those AWS resources out there. And let's dive deep into that. Typically, what happens at any uh, company or enterprise is the platform team will go ahead and set up a structure where they can easily help a developer go ahead and push their code into Git repository. That gets picked up by a CEI tool, and then that will get picked up by a CD tool, basically continuous deployment. And everything is quite seamless. The code will basically come in from the Git repository, get deployed into the Kubernetes cluster. And this is where everything seems to be really fine. Everything works fine. And we end up trying to improve the CI CD pipelines by improving the seconds in which it runs. But is that the actual bottleneck? Uh, that's, not, that's not a bottleneck at all. I, I can guarantee that most of us are able to get this sorted very quickly and fairly. But what happens with the application itself is that it's dependent on external resources, which is basically, for example, in this case, this application is dependent on an S3 bucket, SQSQ, and a DynamoDB, which is quite normal for a microservice to be dependent on. So what happens next? We want to deploy these uh, dependencies, right? And up until like the last, in the last four years, I always thought that I am a platform engineer before being, in, uh, before being a solution architect. And I thought I am a really good DevOps lead to help my, uh, all the companies that I've worked at go ahead and create CI CD pipelines. But right now I realized that it was not DevOps, it was not GitOps, it was uh, not an efficient platform setup. Uh, it was more of ticket ops. So what we do, almost all of us, is ask the developer to create a ticket. And then that goes into us, the platform team. And then we go ahead and set up a framework where we have a very efficient Terraform or CDK code that will go ahead and deploy, deploy these uh, resources. But with time, we have thousands of applications. We have thousands of developers. And that ticketing system becomes a bit clogged up. What we try to do, uh, we have a really good initiative where we think that, oh, let's just try to pass this on to developers. Why don't they own their own infrastructure that is basically being used by their application? And that's a great idea. Mm, or oh, maybe not. Uh, I can see a few smiles uh, in the audience, so I can see a lot of experienced people in this regard. So what happens next? We will go ahead and try to see how a developer can take a Terraform code and deploy just one of these, right? Just maybe the S3 bucket. But we know that it's not just not the S3 bucket. It's basically a few more resources because everything needs permission. And then we have the role and policy as well along with that. All right, so it's easy. We have the developer there. We've provided them the Terraform code. What does the Terraform code look like for a developer? It looks like this. So just three resources, quite simple. Much easier to deploy on the console. And then you see over here for a developer, no need to even read through that. It's quite a lot for anyone to go through this and then to deploy this when they are not used to Hashiko language or Terraform at all. But you would say, you would say that I'm a, I have been a developer, a DevOps engineer, or a platform engineer. I would never do that. I would not just give them a raw Terraform code. I would make it pretty, easier, abstracted, and provide them a nice module. Right? So let's see what happens when we provide them with that module. The developer will just go ahead on their local system and just click on Terraform Apply. No, <laughs> that will never happen. We will never let them do that because there's compliance, there's security, and developers do not have access to most of the environments out there apart from most probably the dev accounts, right? So as platform engineers, we will have to go ahead and create a whole framework. What does the framework look like? We need to create pipelines for them to use the Terraform code. And then we need to create layers of authentication, first layer of authentication into the CI CD 
two. Then the next one would be the Terraform state. And obviously, the compliance team will ask us to go ahead and get that dev ID across the trace right into the S3 tag so that we know who's the owner. OK, let's, let's assume we are a very decent uh, platform team, and then we can go ahead and achieve that. What happens next? I go ahead and deploy the uh, resources using that Terraform module. What I need to do next as a developer in this case is to take these values for a bucket name, which is easy, but then you, you, we all know the struggles with ARNs, right? We take those ARNs and then we push it or manually place them into the values.yaml file. And then we expect everything to work fine and things get deployed right away, fingers crossed. Uh, you would be quite lucky if you tried this the first time and it happened. We, we all know Terraform can fail for apparent no reason a lot of times as well, or it does not provide us the exact reason why it's failing. So imagine a developer trying to do that and getting those logs and not understanding what happens. But let's just assume that they've deployed it. And let's assume that being fair, they took like two hours to deploy this part, just the S3 bucket with the permissions. Now imagine a real world scenario where we have multiple dependencies out there. We have multiple resources to deploy. So for example, if we talk about one application dependent on 10 uh, AWS resources, in multiplying that with 1,000 applications or 100 applications, that's like 1,000 hours of dev time going into just trying this, right? But let's say that we've been able to achieve all of this. What happens next? Ah, oh, continuous compliance. So we've deployed the S3 bucket. And now, when I go ahead and try to use my application, it doesn't work. I fi find out that the compliance team somehow has go gone ahead and either deleted the bucket or blocked the bucket because it did not follow the right compliance. For example, tagging, or it was just using uh, the public uh, route to the bucket rather than using a private link or a private gateway. What do we do now? We could go ahead and try to understand the fact that we've just used a Terraform code, we've used a CI CD pipeline, we've deployed it through, and find that our Terraform state file or our Terraform code is not the source of truth anymore. Really hard. So what do I do next as a developer? I will go ahead and let's try to drill down. I'll make it easier for you. So we have dependencies, and now what we want to do is play the game of ticket ops. We will go ahead and contact the infrastructure team to see what happened. They will ask us to create a ticket and then set up a meeting. We all do that. I've done that. And that's fair for the platform team, right? Because they have their own backlog. What happens next is the infrastructure team will tell you that it's actually compliance that is causing the problem. So I create that ticket for compliance team and then a meeting a week after that. All right. What they tell me is that you're using a public route to the bucket. Change that to a private gateway. A new ticket and meeting for the network team now. So I call this, if anyone is aware, or a lot of us, if they follow soccer, football, uh, the tiki-taka of tickets, right? Uh, tiki-taka basically in football term means you go through a lot of passes before trying to attempt the goal rather than just trying it right away. Works very well in football, does not work very well over here. We've all been through this. So why not use an API framework to go ahead and resolve these problems? For example, if you go on Amazon.com and if you want to buy something, add something to your cart, you do not have to basically go ahead and call the customer service to call the bank to make the payments. You do not have to give your PIN or anything else. 
all of this is all accompanied within the API call that you make from the, your web browser, making that payment, and the security and compliance is Ill, inbuilt with that API, right? So what happens in this scenario? We basically make all the calls through APIs. We do not involve the ticketing system that much. We basically commute, communicate via code and pull requests. And if, if I can tell you this, if, you, if we basically as teams follow the process of communicating via code and use APIs, we will basically go ahead and get rid of all the meetings and tickets out there. No, no, I'm just, I'm just kidding. That is not going anywhere. But I can promise you this, if you follow, follow this through, uh, it will substantially reduce. And that's where we find the bottleneck lies. All right, so why not br uh, build, build your own API framework? Um, I would suggest not to because we already have a solution. We all know that. That's the topic of the talk. It's Kubernetes. Why not use Kubernetes API to go ahead and solve our problem? The reason being, it has everything that you need to go ahead and deploy these resources out there. All right, so is there anyone who is already deploying external resources using EKS, Kubernetes, API? Two, three, okay, awesome. Maybe more of you are doing that, especially if you're using AWS or EKS, because if you can imagine using ingress and if you put in the value load balancer, that's an external resource, right? It's just that you're not building a custom controller or your platform team is not going ahead and creating that setup for you that we do not realize it, but we are already doing that. A lot of projects out there can actually help you build EKS clusters from EKS clusters using this. Woo, that's not good. Let's see. Ah, uh, it now has become 137 slides. Now, let me just quickly go down to... Yep. Okay. Awesome. All right, so storage as well. EBS volumes, uh, CSI drivers, uh, we, we have been using those as well. A lot of us are. So we are already doing that. It's just that it's not visible to us in terms of the work that it requires. But what if we want to go ahead and do that to the whole setup? Right? Why not? It's already working. Why not go ahead and use solutions that do that for us? So there are solutions out there already. Uh, for example, ACK, there's Crossplane as well. Uh, anyone has created a custom controller? A few brave souls uh, out here. Uh, that, that, that is hard work, uh, but a lot of learning, but hard work. So, we always recommend if there is a CNCF tool out there, why not go ahead and use that? So what I'm gonna do is, Crossplane has been there for a long time, so I'm gonna talk about ACK because that's more recent and it has more development uh, that has taken place. So ACK, AWS Controllers for Kubernetes, is basically an open source project donated by AWS and it, it is uh, predominantly developed by, a, still developed by AWS. Uh, what it does is provides you a simple operational uh, scheme to go ahead and do what we had discussed, uh, deploy external resources. And there are about quite a few uh, controllers that are generally available within ACK now. When I say generally available, you get the backing of the enterprise support team when something goes wrong with these controllers. So that's a big plus point if you're using uh, AWS in a large way. Uh, if, you, if you're using uh, other cloud uh, solutions, then uh, we can talk about it uh, a bit later on, where I can reveal a bit more about the plans that we have in the future. But talking about ACK again, so this year, uh, AC, uh, the EKS team ha has taken ownership of uh, ACK controllers again, and they are investing heavily. For example, uh, oh, 
not 44. So this week, uh, we, have, we have reached 46 controllers that are generally available, which means if something goes wrong, we'll support you. And basically, 90% of the code is generated. When we look at the roadmap for this one, we are planning to have hit 50 controllers generally available, but that will surpass the value because we've already reached 46 now. And 98% of the code is generated, uh, is the target for us. All right, so that's all good in terms of talks, but how does it look when we try to deploy uh, the whole setup within the initial setup that we talked about, just the platform team providing us the capability of deploying code into the Kubernetes cluster, why not do all together with the external resources? So we need an S3 bucket. The platform team basically goes ahead and uh, puts the controller within your cluster. They will basically do uh, some background work in terms of setting up the templates or custom resources. For developer, this is it. For an S3 bucket, earlier we saw that Terraform template, or basically we saw the uh, Terraform module. But right now, what they have to do is set values.yaml field S3 enabled true. And that's it. What that will do is create a custom resource or managed resource within your cluster. That will talk to the controller which will go ahead and deploy the whole setup for you. All right, demo. This is a live demo. And as you know, demo gods have not been nice to presenters recently. So I'll try my best to see if we can work through it. Ah, I need to click escape and then come here. All right. So what I have here. It's too small, right? Let me see if I can make that big. Is that readable? It's not a lot anyways. It's basically values.yaml file telling you that we're just wanting an S3 bucket uh, that's enabled, and we provided the name for the S3 bucket over here. Uh, and that's it. What I'm using is Argo CD to basically show you the UI side of things and how the application will get deployed. I'm also using uh, Argo CD sync waves so that we deploy the dependencies first and then the final application, uh, which over here would be the S3 bucket and uh, the IAM role and the IAM policy. Uh, and the, there'll be an external job uh, which will go ahead and deploy, uh, or not deploy, pick up the ARN for the role and push it into a secret so that we can use that uh, for the uh, service account itself. All right, so let's try to go to Argo CD. Uh, that looks better. All right, there's nothing here. Uh, let me refresh and see if I'm not logged out. I'm not logged out, all right, awesome. I'll go to the yes. Yes, I'm logged out, logged out here. Yes, I knew somewhere it had to happen. Anyways, that's a bit expected when it comes to SSOs. Uh, so let me just go ahead and log in. Yep. And then let me just reload, which is. Anyways, I'm happy that this is not a part of the exact demo. It's just for, to verify the demo is working. Cool, so everything is empty. In terms of the bucket, we do not have it here because it starts with an ACK and it's not here. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna deploy the Argo app. I've set the sync to not be enabled, or the auto sync itself so that we can see how the deployment goes through. Let's go back into Argo. All right, I can see there's an app created. We already, as you can see, we have the bucket over here, and then we have the role, policy, and then we have 
our application. If we just use Argo CD, not sync waves, what will happen is it would basically fail because the application will try to deploy with the S3 bucket being created, but uh, we've used the sync wave, so it should be fine. So let me go ahead and sync this. The bucket gets created. We get the IAM policy created. We get the role created after that. External job to go ahead and get the ARN and push it into the secret. We have the app created. And what the app does is it goes ahead and verifies the S3 bucket is there and uploads a file, which is called test.text, and lists that S3 bucket. So let's just go ahead quickly and see if we have an S3 bucket. All right, yes, we have that here. Cool, so see, did not take a lot of time. Uh, and we already have the bucket out here with IAM policy, IAM role, uh, service account, and having that application being able to access the S3 bucket and upload uh, the uh, test file itself. Cool. Let's go back to the presentation. If I see. All right. So that was a presentation, but I know a lot of you are platform engineers, want to know more than just S3 enabled. You want to know what's under the hood. So let me try to go back quickly and see if we can quickly show you how the S3 bucket YAML looks like for that. To escape this, yep. That's because we are using ACK, it's pretty straightforward. The orchestration behind this is through Helm charts and obviously Argo. But if you're just talking about S3, this is the Helm chart. Obviously, it can get more lengthier because you want it to use more options like goes, you want to use pub, uh, bucket policies and so on, which you can add over here. But you know what is needed by the application. So for the developers, it's just S3 enabled true. You can give them more leverage in terms of choosing what the settings are, but it's up to you. But it can be as easy as that values.yaml out there. Cool. Let's go back really quickly. All right. So. Today, the demo that I showed and the tools that we use are already incorporated within the CNCF and Kubernetes family. It works well with Gatekeeper. You can set guardrails in terms of what APIs they can call, what controllers they can call, or what kind of resources they can build. If they have to add tags or not, and what kind of tags you want to add, you can do all of that. You can integrate this, as you saw, with Argo, but also Flux, and so on. It's beyond five, forgive me. Uh, all right, so what are customers using Kubernetes to deploy right now? We have the stats, and it's obviously the first one is IAM because everything needs permission, so IAM would top that. The next one is S3, and that's why I chose S3 today for the demo. And then we have RDS, EKS, SQS, we have SageMaker, and so on as well. And the number will keep increasing, and we'll have more uh, API-based deployments uh, in the coming years as well. All right, so this part uh, makes me laugh a little bit because uh, this reminds me of uh, one of my friends that I used to work with, uh, a really uh, amazing guy. Uh, I think he works, still works at Mantle. Uh, and he's super keen, excited, uh, and really, really passionate about Kubernetes. So whenever I tell him about a new tool, he's like, I have to try that on my Minecraft server that I've deployed on my Kubernetes uh, cluster. I was like, why, why would you want to do that? It's just, I'm excited about the tool. I want to do this. And this is what I expect from a lot of platform engineers when I talk to them about this. Because when I talk to them about this, they'll say, this is really cool. What I'm going to do is I'm going to go back to my desk, and I'm, st I'm starting to deploy a VPC, network, uh, monitoring, and so on. And I would request you guys to not do that first. Uh, look at the backlog uh, and look, look at the uh, bottleneck out there. 
it's mostly with the AWS resources or from which your app is dependent on. So start, try to start from there, and then you will start seeing improvement in terms of less tickets and things being more seamless and the time reducing in terms of deployment to production as well. All right, so I started off by talking about a disappointment in terms of in the 20 years, have we done much? But then I want to say that we've done a lot. We started, we started with the Linux server being set up from scratch and it took kind of months. And then we had EC2 come in and then it took just a few days or a, or a few minutes to deploy that Linux server. Then we had a monolith which took like six weeks to deploy into that EC2. But now we have Docker, we have Kubernetes, uh, Terraform to help us in terms of deploying everything as code. And that, that's quite, uh, quite an ac accomplishment, I think. We should be really proud of ourselves. But the reason why I'm talking about this now is we have these new tools that we can use. And I'm very sure that in the future, in the coming few years, We'll be going ahead and deploying everything using that API framework that I talked about. But most probably in like five years, I might be standing here and then talking to you about new bottlenecks. So what I want to say is that we should not think of the platform, uh, infrastructure platform uh, or internal developer platform as something that we want to do right the first time and then we're done. It's a beast which is self-evolving, and it has to evolve continuously. So we may need to make continuous improvements throughout, and that's how the approach should be uh, as well. So hopefully, uh, maybe in the next uh, Cube Day talk, I'll be introducing you a new abstraction layer for ACK or for the whole API framework as well. Maybe, maybe not. I can't say a lot, but yeah, uh, that is that might be on the roadmap very soon. Cool. That's it. Thank you.